Okay. Fingers and toes. Fingers and toes, <laughs> ladies. You're a good boy. Should be there in a second. Okay. Are we? Where are we? Mm -hmm. Are we? Yep, we are live on Facebook, I believe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fine. Oops, and I got a puppy that's being a little bit of a brat. Okay. So we are live on Facebook. I'm going to try to monitor this for a second and then I will introduce you. We still technically have a minute. So, mm -hmm. okay. Um, let's see. Can we, do we need to go to the National Hawaiian Museum page? People are probably seeing this part. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> smile, smile. <laughs> Um, in, in the words of the, the wonderful priest and holy apostles here in the suburb when he did his first live stream, nobody expects us to be NBC. <laughs> okay, nobody expects this to be NBC. That is a fact. I know. Okay, yep. Okay, it looks like Good. Good news, maybe. And yep, we are live. It looks like we are live. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's let let people join us. Um, once again, thank you. We have, we have eight people watching so far, that's pretty good. Um, so, oops, we're gonna turn that off. Off the window, I think that's um, that's easier for me to see. Um, so welcome all um, to the National Hellenic Museum's um, first attempt, as it were, at a Facebook Live event. Um, not want to create breakout rooms. Okay. Um, welcome all to the National Hellenic Museum's first attempt at a Facebook Live event and the incomparable, and I would add brave, um, Dr. Irini Aspensulidl um, from the Austrian Academy of Sciences um, Institute for Medieval Research is joining us today as our first Facebook Live um, participant. And I can't tell you um, not only how grateful the National Hellenic Museum is, but how grateful I am personally um, that she has agreed to join us. Um, so she is currently working. Oh, today is, of course, the Feast of the Annunciation. Um, mm -hmm. And we at the National Hellenic Museum thought that even though we can't all be together, um, one of the things that's maybe um, maybe something good that can come out of this very difficult time for the whole world is the realization that we really do live in a um, in a global village in um, a community that um, can that can transcend because of technology and I think a little bit because of the human spirit um, can transcend boundaries and this is an opportunity for us to bring so many wonderful and fascinating people doing at research on all sorts of aspects of Greek history and culture to you um, at the National Hellenic Museum. So I um, am, I'm Katie Kalaitis and I'm the resident scholar at the National Hellenic Museum. And I'm sitting at my apartment in, in Chicago and Dr. Afentulido is sitting um, in, her, in her flat in Vienna and we can sort of be together. And we can talk about um, on the space of the Annunciation, um, childbirth and faith in Byzantium, and look at the ways in which um, Byzantine prayer books um, and the history of the prayers around the childbed, um, what those things can tell us 
about, about larger issues around motherhood and childbirth um, and purity in the Byzantine Empire. So if you're joining us, I would encourage you all to leave um, comments. Um, at the end of, of um, the presentation, I will, I will be reading those comments and hopefully there will be questions um, here. And we are very, very fortunate today to have you. So I'm going to turn it back over, over to you as it were. Thank you very much, Katie. And uh, thank you very much for this uh, call for paper. So to say it came in a week uh, where we had otherwise so many cancellations, I had to cancel one event after the other. So when uh, I got this uh, invitation from you, I thought, okay, that's, that's something different than all the cancellations of the past <laughs> few days. So it's something, it was something to look forward to. I, well, I, I think when life gives us lemons, we millennials make pink lemonade. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm really excited. Um, hopefully everyone can see your, your PowerPoint. Hopefully we have worked out um, the, the, the downside for that um, both Irini and I were trained as as um, people interested in the ancient medieval world, the downside <laughs> is that we um, aren't necessarily um, technical experts extraordinaire, but hopefully everyone can see your PowerPoint presentation. And yeah. um, yes, I, I, so. I, look forward to, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. I'm not, I'm not, only, um, I'm not only the interlocutor, I'm an, an eager audience member. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so first, uh, let me shortly explain the term prayer books. I chose the term so as to avoid using jargon in a title of a public lecture, but uh, the word prayer book can be misleading. It is often used to label books with prayers to be read in private. And this is not what I intend to talk about now. In fact, there exist hardly any collections of private prayers from the Byzantine time. So what I mean by prayer books are the Ephologia, uh, so you have the Greek term here with English transcription. In English, it is usually called the Book of Needs, which is a translation of the Slavonic Trebnik. Uh, the Ephologia are liturgical books to be used by the priests for the various needs of the church community. The oldest uh, extant Ephologion originates from the end of the 8th century, but the uh, manuscript of Cologia continued to be copied until well after the introduction of printing. So uh, let me uh, very briefly talk about uh, the contents of the Cologia so that uh, we can put the childbed prayers in context. Uh, so this is uh, one of the first uh, printed uh, Cologia and uh, the edition that uh, is uh, still widely used in, uh, in scholarship by Jacques Gore. Uh, <coughs> sorry. So uh, hardly any manuscript of Hologian is identical to the other in terms of content. There are differences in the number of texts they contain, on the subjects they cover, on the texts chosen for every subject, on the order in the manuscript and unsurprisingly in the textual variants. Uh, so the basic contents of the Ephologion are very roughly the following. The Eucharistic liturgies, uh, the services for the daily circle, other services for various celebrations, other liturgical content, and the occasional prayers, which are the focus of my research. The occasional prayers, or sometimes called small prayers, are covered topics such as birth, childbirth, churching of mother and child um, on the 40th day after birth, blessing of midwives, and also other topics like blessing of food, blessing of agricultural activities, of uh, fishers, nets, blessing of domestic animals, blessing of a house, offering of fruits to church, the purification of a contaminate, contaminated food container, prayers for those who have eaten impure food, prayers for, uh, for the sick, prayers for travel, the, the right for ritual brotherhood, for adoption, 
for the conversion to Christianity, rarely or more often uh, for the reconversion of a Christian who had abandoned the Christian faith and wanted to return, etc. So as you see, the occasional prayers of the Ephologia cover a wide range of subjects in the lives of women, men and children of all strata of the society. Therefore, there are, they are important sources for social history. However, it is only recently that uh, their potential in this field is being discovered. Thus, some important publications written by Byzantinist and medievalist appeared in the last years, uh, together to important publications in the field of liturgical studies, of course. So we have a, a, the, the book by Beatrice Casso, who examined Byzantine attitudes to, attitudes to food and nourishment, including Ephologian prayers for food. Margaret Dimitrova analyzed Slavonic prayers for childbirth. So she's very close to my research interest. Uh, Claudia Rapp examined the right of ritual brother making based mainly on Ephologian prayers. Uh, so in the year 2015, the Vienna Ephologia project was initiated. Uh, I am part of this project, so my project, my project is part of this project. Uh, the aim of this larger project, of the Vienna Ephologia project, is to study the Ephologia as a source for social history. So we all work in registering Ephologia up to the middle of the 17th century, and uh, each one has also uh, their own research field according to our scholarly interests and academic background. So here you see a picture of our team after a library visit at the Apostol Bibliolo Biblioteca Apostolica Vaticana. Now we cannot visit Rome for, uh, we wish everybody in Italy and the Vatican all the best. Uh, so from the left to right is uh, Giulia Rossetto who works uh, with Palimpsest Ephologia, that is Ephologia written on reused parchment. Elias Nesseris focuses on schooling prayers, uh, that is prayers for when a child is sent to school for, a fir for the first time, or when a child has learning problems. Uh, the project coordinator, Claudia Rapp, works on prayers for lay social relations, notably brother making and uh, fraternities. Elizabeth Schiffer works on prayers related to historical events. Uh, currently, she works on prayers for the conversion or reconversion to Christianity. I work uh, with the uh, prayers on childbirth, as uh, you have heard. And uh, Daniel Galazza is a liturgical scholar who works with liturgical books and provides liturgiological feedback. So uh, now let's turn to the childbirth related prayers. Uh, one of the earliest childbed prayers is the prayer for the eighth day in which the child is sealed and uh, that is by the sign of the cross and given a name. This is the only prayer for this occasion. This prayer is hardly ever used nowadays and uh, judging from the signs of use in the manuscripts, it was also hardly used in, uh, in the Byzantine times. You can uh, see whether prayer was uh, commonly recited or not uh, by looking at the greasy margins. Uh, the, and then you can see whether this page was uh, held uh, open often or not. Uh, so um, the earliest extant prayer book transmits also one prayer for the churching of the child for the 40s day. And uh, this prayer is transmitted in most prayer books thereafter. And in the course of the century, two more prayers for this occasion were added. From the 10th century onwards, we have the first prayers for the churching of the woman. That is when a woman first goes to church on the 40th day after birth. So prayers for the churching of the woman are first attested in some Southern Italian Greek Ephologia. And from the 13th century, practically every Ephologian transmitting prayers for the churching of the child also includes prayers for the churching of the woman. So two prayers are transmitted for this occasion. 
from the 15th century, manuscripts transmit prayers for the woman who has given birth, said at home on the day of birth. So far, I found 22 different prayers for this occasion in manuscripts from the 15th uh, and the 16th centuries. <coughs> the appearance of so many prayers, so many different prayers within a relatively short period of time may indicate that uh, prayers for the day of birth were created before the 15th century, even if we lack manuscript evidence. This is supported by the testimony of Simon, the Bishop of Thessalonica, who wrote at the beginning of the 15th century. Uh, it may be a disturbing text, but uh, I will, we will have to deal with it. Uh, so this, uh, he wrote a treatise in form of question and answers on the sacraments. And one question deals with prayers said at home on the day of birth. <coughs> and he speaks of these prayers as an already established practice. So the question is, uh, why is a prayer said by the priest at the birth of an infant? And the answer is, when an infant is born by a pious woman, the priest comes and praises God, giving thanks because a human is born to the world. And he seals and blesses the newborn and prays that it is preserved and receives the baptism and chrismatium. For the mother, he, he prays for what brings her salvation. And he administers her and the woman who are with her grace and sanctification. And he gives them permission to pursue their work without being prohibited or partaking of pollution or being insecure by the envious apparitions of the evil one in any way. For they assisted the birth resulting from sin and voluptuousness, which some call, as it is, forerunner of corruption and death. <coughs> well, I said that it's a disturbing text. Um, anyway, it shows that the practice was common before the first prayers were included in the Hologion. And it is an indication that there might have existed further means of transmission of these prayers, like leaflets or oral transmission, or maybe uh, the priests modified existing prayers. So from the 15th century, we have also prayers for further birth related issues. I have found six prayers for the midwives or generally the woman who assisted the birth, four prayers for the case of miscarriage. And uh, finally, uh, rarely, a prayer to be said at home between birth and churching on the 15th or the 20th day. One remarkable thing about the new prayers from the 15th century onwards, is uh, that is the prayers for the day of birth, for the midwives and for the miscarriage, is the shift from the, from the church towards the private household. The early prayers for the eighth and the 40th day were said at the threshold of the church or inside the church. But the new prayers are said in the house in which the baby was born. Another remarkable feature is the number of the new prayers. One of the reasons for the proliferation of prayers is their formulaic character. So they're basically structured in formulas that uh, you could rearrange or borrow from one prayer uh, to, or from other prayers. So it was uh, not difficult to create a prayer, a new prayer ad hoc. So prayers, or sometimes prayers written for one occasion are repurposed to be used for another, or sometimes only with a change of the title. We have, for example, an absolution prayer, that is a prayer for the remission of sins, which is titled as prayer for the day of birth uh, in one manuscript, which is uh, also, you saw the, uh, the background of this uh, idea that uh, birth has to do with sin. So they could repurpose uh, an absolution prayer for the day of birth. And we have indications that priests could adapt existing prayers to new concerns. For example, we have a prayer as a, titled as a prayer for the woman who has, who has given birth. And in the margins, we have a note 
uh, an instruction to the priest, you can say this prayer also for the midwives. So I think that this liberty to adapt prayers or create new ones may have to do with uh, the shift towards the private realm. Like in services such as the Eucharistic liturgies or the baptism, changes were very slow. But once you move out of the church towards the private household, you can improvise. So the concerns of uh, the childbed prayers, uh, one can notice a shift also as regards the concerns of the childbed prayers. In the prayers for the child on the eighth and the 40th day, the main concern is the Christian initiation. So anticipating baptism. The, is for the prayers for the woman uh, on the 40th day, the main or rather the only concern is uh, ritual purity. According to Byzantine church law, a woman was considered ritually impure for 40 days after she had given birth and also for seven days after the beginning of menstruation. She was not allowed to enter the church or receive sacraments unless she was at the point of death. The churching of the woman on the 40th day marked the end of this liminal period. To a smaller degree, ritual purity is addressed also in prayers for the day of birth and also in the prayers for the midwives. Midwives were also considered ritually impure for several days uh, after attending the birth, but the exact number of days will vary from manuscript to manuscript. The idea that birth and the subsequent blood issue was polluting was or is common in many cultures. The birth taboo existed also in the religions of the ancient Eastern Mediterranean, and that includes ancient Greek religion, Judaism, and probably also the ancient Egyptian religion. In Christianity, both in East and West, there were initially some voices that rejected the birth uh, and menstruation taboos, but uh, these voices were uh, soon replaced by those uh, who did not question the taboo. And in the last Byzantine centuries and beyond, uh, maybe until now in some uh, regions or parishes, the consensus uh, was that menstruation and birth made a woman incapable of entering the church and uh, partaking with the Holy Communion. In principle, ritual impurity is not to be confused with sin. Uh, ritual impurity is involuntary and does not bring any moral blame. But uh, in practice, the distinction because, uh, between ritual impurity and sin is not always as clear as uh, it is maybe in theory. In the new prayers transmitted from the 15th century onwards, new concerns are addressed for the first time. It is only in the prayers for the day of birth that health and well being of the woman and the child are addressed. Health and well being are the most common concerns in other forms of seeking divine protection, such as amulets or pilgrimaging to the tombs of a saint or praying to a saint or praying in front of an icon. However, these concerns were absent from the early of Cologne and were added later. Also the household of the woman and the child is only mentioned in some prayers first attested in the 15th century. And these prayers, also the prayers for the midwives testify to a renewed interest in the network of the lay community. So we have initiation, ritual purity, health and well-being, the household. What is striking from a modern point of view is the complete absence of motherhood in the prayers for birth. Not once in the text of the prayer is the word mother used. In the text that accompany the prayers, that is in the titles and uh, in the instructions in the margins, the word mother is occasionally used. But otherwise, the woman is the accouché, the lechon in Greek, the woman who has given birth, and uh, mainly the servant of God, which is the liturgical formula of referring to anybody receiving a blessing. The child is never called son or daughter, or even her child, 
It is always the child born or carried by her. This is a big issue which needs to be further pursued at another occasion. For now, I can briefly say that, uh, this, that the absence of motherhood in the follow year corresponds with uh, what we observe also in other Byzantine texts uh, regarding the construction of maternal identity. It's, um, so we have uh, Byzantine texts praising mothers, but uh, if we look closer, uh, they praise the mother so that they can indirectly praise their children. So when uh, we have the praise of a mother, it is usually to show that uh, the child has been mothered well. Uh, when the focus is uh, on the woman herself, she's uh, usually presented when she's praised. She is presented as a good Christian, a charitable woman, a good daughter, a good wife, a good nun, of course, uh, mostly but uh, hardly ever a, a good mother. So what is also absent in these prayers is any mention of concerns such as difficulty to conceive, a difficult labor or lactation problems. <coughs> Sorry. The, these were among the most common concerns found, for example, in collections of uh, saint uh, miracles or in magical texts, we have uh, very often in the collections of miracles, that, uh, the pattern that a woman has uh, had tried, had been trying to conceive for many years and, and she could not. And then she went uh, to, to the scent or um, applied some blessed object related to the scent and uh, she got pregnant. Uh, or uh, we have amulets and incantations for women who have a difficult birth. But uh, we don't find any of these concerns in the Ephologion. And this shows the limitations of using the Ephologion as a, a source for social history, because the Ephologion does not cover the whole spectrum of uh, what concerns the Byzantine people. But instead, it offers insights into, into the church discourse on selected topics. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so they, there were many traditions and many devotional practices within Byzantine Christianity, and the prayers of the Phologia represented one of them. The prayers of the Phologia addressed specific concerns and had also a specific uh, way of expression. Uh, first, uh, so let, let us read one prayer for the day of birth. Uh, so uh, to see the typical features of uh, the Phologian prayers, uh, the prayer begins with addressing God, uh, Lord, Lord our God. Then uh, uh, we continue with the recalling of a biblical event, who was born from the Holy Theotokos, the ever Virgin Mary, and was led on the manger and, uh, as a child and appeared as an infant. Then we have the epiclesis, which is the concern of the current prayer. Have mercy upon the servant of your so-and-so who gave birth today. Forgive her deliberate and non-deliberate sins and guard her from every contrivance of the devil. Preserve the child born from her from every sorcery, from every hardship, from every distress coming from the opponent, that is the devil, from evil spirits of the day and the night. Preserve her. Mm -hmm. Under, uh, under your mighty hand and grant her quick recovery. Purify her pollution. Heal the pains. Grant lover of humans strength to her body and soul. Guard her by your bright angels and preserve her from every attack of the invisible opponents. Yes, Lord, guard her from illness and weakness, from envy and the evil eye. And have mercy upon her and the child according to your great mercy. Purify her from the bodily pollution and from the various internal troubles. Lead her out of danger by your quick mercy demonstrated in her humble body and raise her and make the child gestated by her worthy to worship you in the church, which you prepared so that your name is praised. And then we have the doxology for to you is due all glory, honor and uh, worship to the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, etc. <clears throat> Uh, so this is uh, the typical structure of the Ephologian prayer. The priest addresses God in the name of the entire community, 
And the present concerns are put into a cosmic context, into the context of the history of, of the Christian history of salvation. Uh, however, this prayer is also unique. If you, do you hear me? Ah, okay, yeah. Yeah, this prayer is also unique. If we look carefully, we find also features originating in the magical, uh, rather in the Ephologium tradition. First, we have the very mention of sorcery. The uh, women and uh, women after birth were considered especially vulnerable to demonic attack, which is not surprising considering the high rate of maternal and infant mortality. However, mentions of sorcery are extremely rare in the Byzantine liturgical language. In this prayer, we have also one of the very rare mentions of the evil eye in the Phologion. What is meant here is the belief that casting an envious eye on someone may cause harm to the object of envy. This was a very common belief in the ancient Mediterranean cultures and uh, Christian authors usually tried to uh, incorporate this belief into the Christian uh, uh, worldview. So in, uh, so in post byzantine ecology, a prayer against the evil eye appeared, which is uh, still included in uh, some uh, printed ecology uh, even today. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is the very first mention of the evil eye in the ecology in this prayer. And uh, we have also a mention of the angels which is an essentially Christian belief, but uh, guardian angels are very rare in uh, the Ephologian prayers. We have uh, angels as ministering spirits at the throne of God, but the guardian angels uh, are very rare. Uh, angels uh, are, however, very common in uh, magical texts and in amulets. So uh, we saw here that elements belonging to, the, to, to a magical discourse are present in an otherwise typical Ephologian prayers. And this is no, no coincidence that this is a prayer for the day of birth because uh, childbirth entered the Ephologian very lately, as we saw, but uh, birth and uh, gynecological concerns in general were among the most common ones in uh, magical traditions. <clears throat> so, uh, Occasionally, texts which entirely belong to magical traditions, and I, now I must say that uh, the word magical is not uncontested, but uh, I, I use it here uh, for the sake of uh, clarity. So occasionally, texts with, uh, which belong to magical traditions find their way in some Ephologian manuscripts. So we have uh, this uh, text in, an, uh, in the 15th century Ephologion from Patmos, which is a prayer, which is titled as a prayer for a woman with abdominal pains, which means in labor. The, I read the text. A cry came from Bethlehem and the Lord heard it and asked what the cry is. And St. John the forerunner said, a woman giving birth is in a critical condition. Said the Lord, Go, righteous John, and tell her thus, fall infant, dead or alive, the woman shall live, and do not smother the one who gives birth to you. Mary bore Christ. I adjure you by the holy angel who attended when St. Mary bore our Lord Jesus Christ. Come out, infant, and do not smother the one who bears you in the name of the Father and the Son and, and the Holy Spirit. So here we have uh, elements typical of magical text, the text, uh, an uh, abjuration framed in a historiola. Historiola means a short uh, story. So it is, uh, it is not like the analysis, like in the regular prayers, uh, a biblical event is usually a pseudo-biblical or pseudo-hagiographical story. Uh, and this uh, story enables the one who recites the prayer to adopt a, a powerful persona and address the evil or the one who is addressed directly and uh, to command. So in the usual Ephologian prayers, we have uh, or if Lord uh, our God who did this and this and this, now do this and this and this for us, for yours is the glory, etc. 
and uh, in uh, this text, uh, like this one, we have um, so uh, Jesus did this and this and uh, and said, and then I command you, baby, come out or fever, stop or whatever. So uh, such texts for an easy birth circulated widely in Greek. Latin and Slavonic throughout the Middle Ages. And also before, we have late antique papyri or ostrac or lamelle, so thin metal foils with a command, come out infant, Christ is calling you in many versions like come out Lazarus or also the formula Mary Paul, Christ, Elizabeth Paul, John. And then we have the instruction to write this on a paper or on a wooden plate uh, and put, put now the, the, the following text is not very clear, which is not uncommon in, when dealing with such texts. But uh, what it usually means is uh, that uh, you have to wrap, or at least virtually wrap, uh, the woman uh, with his, with his uh, magical object. There were also uh, we have also uh, girdles uh, with embroidered prayers or formulas wrapped around the the belly of pregnant women. Uh, so uh, I try to give a brief overview of prayers related uh, to childbirth in patient and ephologia. Uh, as uh, you see, the ephologia were not static, but developed in time to accommodate further needs of the community. This, this development is particularly clear in the childbirth related prayers. In the first centuries, the participation in, uh, in the liturgical life of the church remained the sole concern. Thus, the only prayers to be read in the first century marked the initiation of the newborn or the end of ritual impurity of, uh, of the mother. These prayers were read in front of or within the church. Throughout the centuries, they had been little textual variation and few additions to these prayers. At the end of the Byzantine era, new prayers were added. They address concerns which had long been the domain of other forms of piety, like the cult of saints or magic. And this left traces to the text of the new Ephologian prayers. Also, the place of the performance marks a shift from the church to the household. The textual transmission becomes more fluid. Texts are modified and new ones are added. And one gets the impression that the priests did not feel obliged to preserve every iota of the text as they were required to do, for example, with the text of the liturgies. Still, some concerns remained outside the scope of the Hologion. Women who had difficulties conceiving a child or had a difficult pregnancy or a risky birth or lactation problems, continued to pray to the saints or to the mother of God or wear amulets that might or might have not been approved by the church. We have to do with parallel devotional traditions, all of which can be traced back to the late antiquity. It was only in exceptional cases that such concerns found their way into the Ephologion, which remained the prayer book to be used by the clergy. So, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I hope that I have not exceeded the time too much. There was no real time, Luna. I was just, I was okay. just offering. This is very <laughs> free. I, um, I want to first thank you um, for an incredible presentation on very short notice. Um, I, I, it looks like you were quite popular. Oh, okay. <laughs> And um, I actually have a few questions for you if I can trouble you for a little bit more of your time. Um, yes, the sure. first question we have, um, great. Um, the first question we have comes from Jacqueline, who is our exhibitions, our fearless exhibitions manager at the museum <laughs> and, um, and my um, theology buddy at the office, actually. Um, <laughs> she asks, um, why did the prayers shift from the church into the private home in the 15th century? Is there any sort of explanation? Is that is that about the conquest of Byzantium? Like what's what's happening there? That is a good question that uh, has been puzzling me. 
I, we notice a shift uh, towards the private realm or towards the uh, family uh, at the end of the Byzantine time, which may have to do uh, with the weakening of uh, of the church uh, structure or the church uh, control. Uh, let's say. Uh, so uh, yes, it is something that uh, we notice uh, also in other in other fields of uh, Byzantine life. Uh, this uh, this uh, interest uh, to the uh, non monastic uh, or, no, uh, or or also to the to the lay and private life. Yes, it it may have to do with the larger geopolitical events, but. Uh, I don't have a definite answer. It's, it's, it still puzzles me. Yeah. And Jack, who I said is my theology, but he does have a follow-up question, as it were. Um, she was wondering what these what these prayer books look like. Are they are they sort of kind of simple codexes? Are they illuminated codexes? What are they simple, of? simple, very simple. Uh, they are uh, just they are simple. They are very clearly written so that. Uh, even people uh, with uh, with very little education or very little literacy could easily read them, uh, but uh, they were. Uh, to, mm, the German word is uh, Gebrauchsbuch, so like a, an, a utilitarian object. Or can you say this? Yeah, 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 utilitarian mm -hmm. object. Yeah, 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 cool. yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, we don't have illuminations. They're usually in a format that uh, you could uh, hold them with one hand. So the idea is that the priest uh, held them with his uh, left hand and uh, with his right hand, he performed the blessings. And it was a book that uh, you could easily carry with you, uh, that the priest could usually uh, could easily carry with them when they went to the house where a child was born or to the fields to bless the, the crop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And then we have, we have a comment. My, my dog has joined us, so he doesn't. It's okay. Uh, I apologize to everyone but, um, to make sure that he doesn't destroy anything. Um, Dan, um, who I recognize from Twitter, shout out Dan. Um, he, he makes an interesting comment. And I, I, I want to, this issue of purity is something I'd like to touch on before I let you go. So mm -hmm. um, he says that he thinks it's interesting that the concept of ritual purity was maintained in relation to childbirth um, when there was you know, there were, I think maybe this is less true in the Eastern Christian tradition, but there was a sort of rejection of concepts of ritual purity in Christianity, um, maybe maybe writ large. Um, mm -hmm. how, how do we sort of, um, how, do, how do you wrestle with this idea of purity around childbirth? Uh, maybe not just in the Byzantine period, but the way we inherit that today, um, mm -hmm. particularly in, in the country yeah. of women. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, sorry, uh, what's the uh, what's the question? In this, uh, so how uh, how do you how do you sort of wrestle with this idea of of uh, ritual purity in childbirth? Uh, I how I, I how I wrestle with this idea? Yes. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> at some point I I just realized that it's, it's uh, not uh, my it's well. Uh, now, personally speaking, okay, uh, I realize that it's not uh, how I uh, relate to the faith, and I started just <laughs> ignoring this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this and, uh, but, and I, think, uh, I think Dan does point out this interesting point, which is um, ideas around ritual purity in childbirth survive in ways that ideas around ritual purity and other other things do not. Um, Yes, uh, in the, you mean in Christianity? In Christianity, yes, or more broadly. Uh, yes, uh, actually, yes, I think that uh, it had to do. It has to do with the general misogyny of uh, the late antique uh, Eastern Mediterranean, and not only. Uh, so, I mean, there is a trend nowadays in uh, our Orthodox Church to attribute uh, this. Uh, Purity, impurity, thinking uh, to to Judaism, uh, which is uh, actually, I think it's rather polemics uh, to do so. Uh, yeah, 
I mean, we have this uh, idea of ritual impurity in uh, the Leviticus, and uh, but uh, but it was a, a very a wide a wider cultural phenomenon, and uh, the reluctance of uh, church people to question. Uh, particularly uh, this uh, taboos pertaining to women, because other uh, other taboos uh, were very easily rejected. But uh, but uh, but there was uh, yeah there was a reluctance to accept. Oh, oh, there was hardly ever hardly any discussion uh, about these uh, taboos. Uh, then, Okay, Dionysus of Alexandria said that the pious woman would not even dare to ask whether she would uh, she could uh, enter the church uh, during menstruation. So, I think the general idea was that uh, th there was a consensus that uh, a consensus that uh, menstruation and childbirth were impure, uh, and uh, it stopped to be discussed. Uh, quite early, I think, uh, yes, in the fourth or the fifth century, there seems to be any discussion. So, uh, we have texts uh, that uh, um, that uh, question this taboo, uh, but very few, and uh, yeah, it was largely unquestioned. That, that, so that's, that's really, you know, that's really interesting. It's, it's problematic, but it's interesting. I have one yeah. last question before I let you go. I know it's evening there, and you probably want to, to get to dinner with your family and things. Um, because today is the Feast of the Annunciation, um, you made this comment that the, mother, the sort of praise of mothers um, in late antique and Byzantine texts mm -hmm. are almost always about praising the child. Mm -hmm. And um, I, 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 I'm, I mean, certainly a lot of the, the sort of veneration of Mary is, is caught up in, um, mm -hmm. in, in praise of Christ. Maybe it's sort of explicitly said that way. Um, I know this is slightly off the topic of your, of your talk, but um, could you just really quickly, do you, do you have some thoughts on um, how how the veneration of Mary fits into these under um, understandings yeah. of childbirth and maternity? I, I think that uh, Mary does not have much to do with this because of uh, the exceptionalism, of Mary's exceptionalism. <clears throat> so the, the church authors, uh, very early tried to present Mary as uh, an exceptional woman and uh, disassociate her with the, the experience of uh, birth and motherhood. So there was this idea that uh, Mary dis did not experience uh, birth pains. And uh, of course that uh, she was uh, she was not impure. So, uh, so I, th I think that uh, it was, uh, it is a phenomenon that uh, is much earlier than uh, Christianity, maybe, because uh, if you look at the uh, conventions of the encomion of the laudatory speeches in the antique rhetoric, uh, if you wanted to praise somebody, you would praise uh, his um, his parents or her, mostly his parents or uh, the city that uh, bore such a glorious son and. Uh, but uh, they would never or hardly any uh, ever praise the children of uh, the one who was being praised. It was uh, it belonged to the conventions of the, the encomion of the encomiastic uh, speeches. Maybe so. I, I don't think that uh, it uh, has to do with uh, with Mary. Uh, although I mean, of course. Uh, or rather, it was that it was the other way around. Not that uh, Mary influenced the idea of motherhood, but uh, maybe that the ideas on motherhood influenced uh, how early Christians uh, or how Christians in the Middle Ages perceived Mary. Uh, oh, excellent. Thank you so thank you. so much. I cannot tell you how. Um, how grateful I am that you agreed to do this. Um, <laughs> Thank I will, you. I will, if you don't mind, um, obviously our Facebook page will continue to get comments. And if we, if we get questions, would you mind me passing those along to you? Um, uh, you um, mean uh, uh, now or uh, what? Sorry? In the future. And so yeah. this, this anyway. will be available. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll pass this along to you. 
Trini, I, I owe you I owe you dinner when we can all be together again. Yes, when uh, <laughs> <laughs> now I cannot e even go to the center of Vienna. <laughs> but sometime oh. we will meet in Chicago or in Vienna or somewhere. <laughs> exactly. We we will see each other again. Um, and when we do, um, I will I will I will buy the first round. Um, thank you so so much. Um, you've proven <coughs> quite popular. So um, thank you. You're you're welcome back anytime, both virtually and in person. Um, thank you. Please stay safe. And same to you. Okay. And and thank you so so much for for an absolutely lovely um, an absolutely lovely and fascinating presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I will warn you, you might want to, um, I'm going to end the meeting so that we don't, um, I, I will, we'll, we'll say goodbye later. I'm going to end the meeting so that we don't have a chit chat on Facebook Live. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Take care.